Tonight on Nova. Scientists at powerful labs in Europe and the United States are working day and night pursuing the same goal, chasing a tiny particle that lasts for one billionth of a billionth of a second. Fire at will. Okay, injecting pee bars. The elusive quark has not existed since the moment of the Big Bang. Who will find it first? The ultimate test of scientific skill is the race for the top. Funding for NOVA is provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. Now 24 hours a day, every day for the next year, this control room will be home to more than 200 physicists seeking new answers to the oldest and deepest questions of science. What is the world made of and how does it work? We have in mind a goal toward which we are moving and which may actually be reached within our lifetimes, within a century, we don't know. Uh, the goal of finding principles of physics which have no explanation in terms of deeper principles, which are, as far as fundamental laws of physics go, the final answer. In the century since British physicist J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, scientists have pursued the final answer through the search for elementary particles and they have uncovered the building blocks that make up everything on Earth. Our world is made of atoms, in which electrons orbit a nucleus of protons and neutrons. And we now know that the proton and neutron are themselves made of still tinier, more fundamental particles called quarks. Electrons and quarks are the foundations of everything on Earth, but they're not the final answer to the mystery of matter. Here at Fermilab on the prairie outside Chicago, experimenters are closing in on these deeper secrets, the foundations of matter throughout the universe and throughout time. Their instrument, a ring four miles in circumference, where they accelerate subatomic particles to nearly the speed of light. As they race around the underground tunnel of the accelerator ring, these tiny bits of matter are smashed in violent collisions. To see what comes out of these high-energy explosions, Fermilab has built a new kind of microscope. Physicists can't observe fundamental particles directly. In the accelerator, the enormous energy of collisions reveals them for only an instant. It's this giant particle detector that enables experimenters to follow their trail. This physics we do is like a voyage of discovery. Okay, where you're, you can imagine you're Columbus and, and you're on the, the, the Nina and the Santa Maria, and this is our Santa Maria that we're setting sail on here. Uh, who knows where, to a new world, we hope. The world revealed by the particle detector contains forms of matter that don't exist on Earth. Quarks that inhabit only the hottest galaxies and quarks that flourished in the seething energy of the early universe. Now, using the unprecedented energy of today's accelerators, experimenters will smash these earthly particles together in search of a quark that lived for only an instant in the fantastic heat and energy of the Big Bang, a quark called Top. Finding the Top quark is the highest ambition of physicists all over the world. Here in the shadow of the Alps on the border between France and Switzerland is the laboratory called CERN, the European Physics Center run jointly by 14 countries. Hidden beneath these streets, CERN operates its own huge accelerator ring, and its physicists are also about to launch an experiment in search of the top quark. 
Today, the CERN team is moving its detector into final position. High energy physics carries a high price tag, but scientists argue that building these huge machines fosters new technology. That's one reason both Europe and the United States have been willing to foot the bill. There's another reason, prestige. If Luigi Dilella, the head of this experiment, can win the race for the top quark, that discovery will attract the finest scientific talent and the most ambitious new experiments to CERN. We are brainwashing the machine people in order to uh, also themselves feel the competition with the United States. Uh, yesterday I pointed out to them that the, uh, the previous two quarks, the charm and the bottom quark, had been discovered in the United States, hoping that they would uh, do also their share of work to have the top discovered here. The competition is, is there. It's very friendly. We, we meet with those people all the time at conferences and the like. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, we're, we're all in the same uh, team together, but uh, uh, you want to get there first. Tim, are you going to bring voltages up when, when the time is right? Okay, good. Roy Schwitters is leading the search for top at Fermi Lab. Okay, and uh, can you check the relays and all that good stuff? Yeah, it's all set. Okay. So now we have to wait for the squeeze. This experiment, called CDF, for Collider Detector at Fermilab, has funding to run for one year. See if I can connect the dots. That may sound like a long time, Full of plot taken. but it feels extremely tight to the physicists, who still have to get their complex detector working. The voltages trip or are just now coming up? We're just not coming up. up. Okay. The voltages are hung up? No, it's programmers. Wonderful. You can't plan for every little detail in advance. You do the best job you can, but then when it comes right down to it, you have to sit there, and a lot of people have to sit there 24 hours a day for weeks on end to make it come up and start taking real data. Melissa Franklin is wrestling with one of these startup problems. She's working on part of the detector that measures the energy of particle collisions. But at the moment, even though there are no particles in the accelerator ring, energy clusters keep showing up. This is noise a spurious signal that she has to track down and eliminate. You look at the scope, you see noise, you, you tell your graduate student, okay, you sit there <laughs> and watch it, time it for an hour, right? And then you get some period and then uh, you figure out what it is, what it is, you know, there's 500 different things going on and you're trying to figure out what it is that's causing noise every two and a half minutes. And you do, or your graduate student does. And that's great, I mean, that's the way it's done. Until they develop that confidence in every part of their detector, the experimenters can't begin to look for the top quark. Can you pause the run? I'm still not going to, I'm still not writing to tape. Yeah, right, still not writing to tape. Okay, I still won't. Our key car problems are back. The other half of the top search depends on the crew in the accelerator control room. They have to engineer collisions in the Fermilab accelerator that are powerful enough to produce the top quark. This is the humble starting point, a cylinder of the most common stuff in nature, atoms of ordinary hydrogen. High voltages from this generator liberate protons from the hydrogen atoms. Billions of protons are then pulsed down a linear accelerator, the first step in bringing them to the highest possible energy. From here, protons are pushed into the accelerator ring. As they zoom around at almost the speed of light, they're bombarded with electrical energy. The protons can't go any faster, so they absorb more and more energy on each pass. They whirl around the ring like cars on a racetrack, but when protons collide, the result is not like a car crash at all. One thing that's really uh, interesting and exotic about these subatomic particles is that when you collide the, collide the protons, uh, you don't just get bits and scraps of proton, you might get, uh, again, if you're thinking about cars, you might get uh, three trucks, uh, a tricycle and a bulldozer coming out of the thing. We use an accelerator as the very opposite of an atomic bomb. An atomic bomb converts mass into energy, whereas an accelerator converts energy into mass. We consume energy to produce new particles. The new particles physicists want to produce are massive, 
so the accelerator has to smash protons as violently as possible, and that requires a head-on crash. It was at CERN in the late 70s that physicists figured out how to produce head-on collisions in a single ring. The solution comes from the strange world of antimatter. We had one big ring in which these particles turn around, and we wanted to collide uh, particles turning around in one direction with particles turning around in the other direction. Now, if you want to turn in the other direction, you must have a particle that has an opposite charge. Otherwise, it's not deflected in the right direction. So you need protons, which are positive, and antiprotons, which are negative. And then you can do that experiment with a single ring. Now, the accelerator ring becomes a collider, smashing bunches of protons into bunches of antiprotons. These collisions release the maximum energy for the creation of new particles. And in 1983, CERN's proton-antiproton collider proved itself triumphantly when experimenters discovered two massive new particles. The collider made CERN the international leader in high-energy physics. Fermilab moved quickly to catch up converting its accelerator into a powerful collider called the Tevatron and building a new facility to produce antiprotons. Now both laboratories are poised to pursue the next big prize in physics, the top quark. The race for top is the final chapter of a story that began here at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center back in 1974. Although the quark theory was already 10 years old, it was still unproven. But then, a young postdoc named Roy Schwitters took part in a breakthrough, an experiment led by SLAC's present director, Bert Richter. This is very much, this anti-accelerator is very much as it was then with more modern electronics, uh, but that's about all that's different. SLAC believes in maximum scruffy, and it's still maximum scruffy. Schwitters and his colleagues built the first modern detector and connected it to a powerful new accelerator ring. Their ambitious innovations paid off on a Sunday afternoon in November in a dramatic story you can follow in the logbook. 3 p.m. This past fill has been incredible. The signal's getting bigger. Wow, the signal's still getting bigger. Wow, it's getting bigger. Wow, it won't stop. Just off scale. And I think that's when everyone, uh, that's when people realize, at least I, you got kind of scared, because this was so far outside the physical realm that we were thinking about. Uh, at least I, I began to wonder, you know, what was happening. They were too high on discovery to even notice champagne. What they'd found was a new particle, clearly made up of two quarks, the first experimental confirmation of the quark idea. Most experiments add incrementally to knowledge. I think all of us knew on Sunday that uh, what we had done was not like that at all. That we had really changed the course of physics in a very fundamental way. And that we had not incrementally turned the wheel a little bit. It had been flung hard over very fast. Astonishingly, the new particle which Richter called Psi at Slack was discovered at exactly the same time at Brookhaven Laboratory, where it was called J. The twin results sparked the November Revolution of Physics, and a new theory of fundamental particles was born. All of the pieces were already in place, but they were speculative. They were generally regarded as crazy ideas that couldn't possibly be true. The electroweak theory, charm, asymptotic freedom, things with funny names that didn't seem to make any sense. Then. Uh, with the November Revolution and the discovery of the J Psi particle, uh, it was clear that these pieces were, as if by their own accord, coming together and forming a theory, a complete and consistent theory of elementary particle physics, a theory that became known as the standard theory or standard model. The new periodic table of matter and energy, the standard model, contains just three families of particles. One includes the electron and its cousins. A second family of particles transmits forces that bind matter together. The third family is the quarks. All matter on Earth is made up of atoms, but the protons and neutrons of atoms are made up of two kinds of quarks, 
down quarks and up quarks. The fiery heat of distant galaxies breeds unearthly matter made of a heavier generation of quarks called strange and charm. By producing charm in particle accelerators, Roy Schwitters and his colleagues developed the quark picture to this point. But at the birth of the universe, in the first trillionth of a second, matter took an even more exotic form. The astronomers have discovered that the universe at one time, in the distant past, just after the creation of the universe and the Big Bang, the universe was immensely hot. And you can replicate that temperature by collisions of particles, of nuclear particles, made in very large accelerators. In these high energy collisions, we are recreating in very small volumes, volumes of the, with a radius of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, the same concentrations of energy which existed immediately after the Big Bang. And there we can find this state of, these states of matter which have very short lifetimes and which therefore decayed immediately at the big, in the Big Bang. Only in the most powerful accelerators can physicists hope to recreate the heaviest, most unstable, most elusive of the quarks. And in 1977, they succeeded, finding a fifth quark called bottom. The symmetry of the standard model requires that quarks come in pairs, that a bottom must have a top. There really has to be a top quark. Uh, boy, I hate to stick out my neck like that, but I don't see any way out of it. If you take the standard model, with just all the particles we know about, except what the top quark left out, then the theory doesn't make any mathematical sense. So the mission of today's experiments, find the last quark, the top. Now we have to get the accelerator working at peak performance. We have to get the detector complete and calibrated and running. And then we have a great opportunity to go out and find it. Where's Alarm the uh, uh, find At Fermilab, they're setting up for a shot trying to put protons and antiprotons into the Tevatron Collider. And in the CDF control room, Schwitters and the other experimenters are anxiously monitoring the accelerator step by step. A cycle, okay, now this will get coalesced. It's accelerated in the main ring, coalesced into one bunch, and transferred to the Tevatron. And there it is, third bunch in the Tevatron. Three of six proton bunches are in. The accelerator crew is off to a good start. No unnecessary plots this time. But the real objective is to get as many particles as possible with the maximum energy into each bunch. Yeah, we got 26 on four also. That's tremendous. Okay, let's see the next one. Here comes the next one. That's a beautiful one. We are keeping these protons that we have now injected, and now we're preparing to inject the actual antiprotons. Okay, so we're going to make a, an adjustment to the, what's called the chromaticity to the protons, and then in a couple of minutes we'll be ready to go. Six by six is off. The next step, injecting the first bunch of antiprotons, or P-bars as they're called, and tension mounts in the control room. While protons circle at the speed of light, operators run through their final checklist. Okay. So you ready, Bill? We, uh, do we just schedule? Yes. Okay, so we've got enough scheduling. And we're, we're good. Okay, go ahead. Up. Fire at will. Okay, injecting P-bars. Okay. The pressure is on. Can they coax enough antiprotons into the Tevatron to give the experiment a fighting chance for top? There it is. Oh, that's a good one. Coalesces. Wow, that's a big one. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. That's the biggest one I've seen. Yeah, that's the biggest one I've ever seen. One more. Okay. Main ring, there it is. Coalesce. Bang. Second one. That's even bigger. Each shot we try to improve things, okay, and this one is a success. Okay, so it has uh, lots of beam for the experimenters. Hopefully they'll get lots of events recorded on tape and make whatever discoveries they're going to make. Okay, great, we got six of them. A little smaller. With beams in the accelerator, okay, today's 10. collisions begin, and the Fermilab search for top rolls on. Nice, that's all the protons in. The wire in, you talk on a... 
Ah, le in. Oui, parce qu'il y a une différence entre le in et le out. Hein. Ah, donc il faut que je change le timing. Ch change le timing pour être sûr. Ouais. Si t'as 14-7, moi je ne toucherai pas. Hein. At CERN, the hunt for top is also in high gear. The CERN staff has the benefit of years of experience operating a collider. Okay, that's But there's a new okay. shot almost every day, and they want each shot to be better than the one before. There's not much difference in time. Okay, we'll try and take that and see how that goes. They're working to improve the accelerator's performance, and that means getting as many particles into the machine as possible, and focusing them into densely packed bunches to produce a high collision rate. The higher the collision rate, the greater the chances of creating a top quark. Uh, how is the, uh, how's the background looking? That sets the goals of the accelerator crew. Increase the antiproton yield, pack the bunches tightly, and provide the top search experiment with the highest possible collision rate. We have an advantage with respect to the Fermilab experiment, and that is that uh, we should, in the next run, have uh, something between two and three times more collisions per second. So CERN is counting on more frequent collisions to put the top quark within its reach. But Fermilab has some significant advantages on its side of the ledger. The Fermilab team, uh, which we're competing with, have firstly more people, uh, possibly more resources, uh, but more importantly they have more beam energy. Um, and in physics, the more energy you pour in, the more things you produce. Beam energy comes from electricity, but high-energy particles want to travel in a straight line. So the CERN beam pipe is completely surrounded by magnets. It takes strong magnetic fields to make the particles circle around the accelerator ring. At Fermilab, the new Tevatron ring uses superconducting magnets, which can produce far more powerful bending fields. So Fermilab can accelerate particle beams to much higher energy. The beam energy at CERN can create particles as heavy as what's called 70 GeV, meaning CERN can produce particles about 70 times the mass of the proton. But collision energies at Fermilab can reach as much as three times higher. No one knows the mass of the top quark, but Fermilab's more powerful collisions could make all the difference. If the mass of the top is not heavier than the, than 70 times the mass of the proton, which is 70 GeV, we have uh, a good chance of uh, uh, winning this race. However, if the mass of the top is substantially heavier than, say, 90 or 100 GeV, then uh, we are out of business. So in the critical area of accelerator performance, the pursuit of the top quark will pit CERN's high collision rate against Fermilab's high collision energy. Both machines are doing well, so it's shaping up as a real horse race. If CERN weren't there running, our guys would be a little more relaxed. And I don't want them to be relaxed. I don't want them to be on edge. So I think it's very good. And every time I get a little uh, bitnet message uh, saying what they've achieved with their, uh, their luminosity, their machine, the number of collisions, I needle our guys and saying, look what they're doing at CERN. What's the matter with you sluggards? People tend to be working much harder than they should. So everyone's a little bit frayed around the edges. They're very excitable. Sometimes they get depressed because things aren't going as fast as they'd like. So everyone's emotions are just at a, at a peak. People stand out in the parking lot going in between where our offices are and where B0 is and complain. <laughs> and they're yelling and screaming. And of course, no one can hear, which is nice. And uh, you throw stones at the pipes and at the main ring and things like that. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of anger just because there's a lot of intensity. The experiment has established a grueling rhythm. 24 hours a day, the physicists keep duty shifts in the control room. Why are we getting so many of these, or is because this not so many? it's a problem. It, no, I mean, this is normal. This is why you have to sit here all day long and do this. Today, Melissa Franklin is at the main console, the key position for making sure that the detector is operating properly and dealing with the inevitable problems. Her eyes are always returning to the most significant indicator of how well the experiment is doing, the counters which show the mounting total of collisions, the raw data of a high-energy physics experiment. Each collision they detect, each event, is a complicated pattern of particle debris. Physicists search these events for clues because the top quark is too elusive to show up directly. The top quark, being 
being very uh, heavy, uh, it will itself decay almost immediately. In fact, uh, the lifetime of the top quark is, uh, I would say, of the order of uh, a billionth of a billionth of a second. So experimenters have to decipher the decay patterns of collision events. For that, they rely on their detector, the huge underground machine that surrounds the collision point in the beam line. The detector identifies decay particles emerging from a collision by measuring their paths and their energies. Each layer of the detector plays a different part in the process. This is a Tevatron beam pipe. The protons move in this direction, the antiprotons move in this direction, they collide in the middle of the central detector, about 10 feet behind me. At Stanford, they're building a new detector, and it's easier to see the massive scale of the central section. The beam pipe will be surrounded by this large cylinder, containing a vast array of very fine wires. In a collision, particles fly right through the beam pipe, and these wire chambers will sense their electric charges, producing a high-resolution picture of the paths of the decay products. When particles collide in the CDF detector, their tracks are read by the delicate wires of the central section. Then, a massive layer of iron stops the particles to measure their energy. But a few are so energetic, they keep going into the final layer of the detector. The last sector is the muon detector. It is last precisely because muons are identified by their ability to penetrate a lot of material. For instance, in order to get to the back plane of the muon detector, they have to go through something like 12 feet of solid steel, something that high-energy muons do very easily. As a matter of fact, they just keep going. At CERN, the top search experiment is called UA2 because the detector is housed in underground area number two. The detector is constructed in layers, roughly similar to CDFs. But at the very heart of its detector, UA2 has an innovative layer, one that CDF doesn't have. With the detector opened up, the CERN beam pipe is exposed as it passes through the center. And wrapped snugly around it is a slender package of integrated circuits called a silicon detector. This is the closest any detector has ever come to the actual collision point, providing especially fine data for the top search. The silicon detector adds thousands of new channels to the staggering flow of data that travels over these cables. From the detector, across the underground hall, the cables lead to a bank of computers and on to the UA2 control room. Apart from the new silicon element, UA2 has operated its detector in several previous collider runs. Luigi and his colleagues are intimately familiar with their machine and able to interpret its signals with confidence. We have more experience. We've been in the collider business since 1981, and CDF are really on their first major run. So they have all the surprises in store, which you find when you try and do this sort of physics. Saturday night, on shift in CDF control. It's calm for the moment. But surprises are never far off. Uh, is it back up? No. Yeah, it is. Is it? Yeah, it's back. Yeah. No, but is the CTC back up there? No, so I, it, whoop, it, it's up there. So no, I think you want to pause. Yeah, it takes what? a while to put off the screen to all the voltages to come back up. At that point, you know you're okay. There are two things wrong at the moment. There's our calibration has changed slightly because the weather has changed, the pressure has changed, and there's a chamber that's not happy. And we've actually looked at the data, and it looks okay. And the main thing is that we've decided just to keep going. The data is still coming in. The scaler is still counting. It's not serious enough to affect the data, so we're not going to stop. Events come pouring out of the detector, four stories below. Inside here, particles are colliding 50,000 times every second. The detector sends a stream of tracking and energy data on every one of these collisions up to the control center. But this much information would swamp the experimenters, and most of it is only routine physics anyway. 
To cope with the flood, CDF has designed some of the fastest computers ever built. In one second, from 50,000 collisions, these computers pluck out just one event to be saved. This is the first step towards zeroing in on events that might contain traces of the top quark. Still, the flow of collision data is so great that a new computer tape gets filled every few minutes. These precious records of the most informative events are collected every day by a technician. This is the next step in their long journey through data analysis, the careful sifting of clues for signs of the top quark. We run all the data tapes that come off the detector uh, within 24 to 48 hours to select off the cream of the crop of the events to get them into the hands of the physicists as quickly as possible. This rapid dash through the data, what's called the spin cycle, picks out a fraction of the remaining events which show the most promising evidence for top. The funnel reduces the volume of data to a level that scientists can actually study. And the latest results of the experiment go off to the universities and laboratories which make up the CDF collaboration. One team within CDF is based in California at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in the hills above the UC campus. The flow of data summary tapes enables the Berkeley group to work in the front lines of the analysis while still at their desks 2,000 miles from Fermilab. At Berkeley and throughout the rest of the collaboration, 200 physicists are hunting for evidence that the top quark has been produced. You've been building the detector for eight years, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a room on a computer actually figuring out what's happening, what's actually going on with these tiny particles. It's pretty amazing. And then you say, okay, you say to people, uh, other physicists, yes, I'm measuring the mass of the W or the mass of the Z, and it sounds like just normal stuff, and yet it's something about the universe that it's incredibly hard to measure. Hardly anyone does it, and it's totally cool. To figure out what actually happened in a collision, you have to know how to interpret event diagrams. For example, what particle left these traces? The first clue is the tall red spike. That's a high-energy electron. Clue number two, if you count up all the energy in all the spikes, it doesn't add up to the full energy of the original collision. So we go to a reconstruction of the same event. Clue number three, the missing energy is here, in a well-defined area. That's evidence of a neutrino. Conclusion, this is the signature of the force-carrying particle called W, one of CERN's big discoveries in 1983. So it can be decay or heavy quarks. A key player in the W search was a young physicist named Steve Gear. Today, Steve Gear is part of the Fermilab team. It was an extremely exciting period. We were scanning for months things that looked vaguely like an isolated electron, but not really convincing, not convincing at all. And then one day, we got the real McCoy, a genuine object. And it was so impressive, it was so spectacular, very different to any of the background events. We knew that that was a W. It would be nice if a single decisive event like this could nail down the top quark. Unfortunately, that's wishful thinking. There are people who believe that uh, the discovery of the top will be just uh, like one or two events which you suddenly see, reconstructed by the computer, you get a printout possibly a color printout, and then you go around showing it like a flag and saying, this is top, this is top. This happened for the W and the Z, because there was no other process that could simulate events with that configuration. But for top, we know of many other background events that can appear like top and are not. So many types of events could signal a top decay. It's theory and calculations that give experimenters an idea of what patterns to look for. OK, here's an event that uh, is a good candidate for a top decaying. We see a narrow, a high spike that's pink, which means all the energy went in the front of the calorimeter, so we know that's an electron. Uh, not shown here, but we can tell from the reconstruction is that there was, again, large missing energy, so we know there was a neutrino present. But in addition, we see another cluster of energy here in a different direction, another cluster. There's actually two different clusters here, one behind the other, and there's still another small cluster over here. Now, we can't tell on the basis of this one event whether it is top or not. But this is the kind of signature we're looking for. And if we see a significant number of events like these, then we could 
conclude the existence of the top quark. Then uh, the top trigger. The experimenters are investigating several decay signatures for top. To pool results, they gather every few weeks for a meeting of the top quark analysis group. They come from Japan, Italy, and the 14 U.S. institutions that make up CDF. Coordinating the far-flung efforts of independent-minded scientists is a management challenge. And CDF has a new leader. Mel Shockett will have to hold the collaboration together as they enter the final phase of the top search. What we're trying to do now is get uh, groups of physicists looking at all of the different possible decay channels so that we have a big picture of whether there is a hint of a signal there and whether there's not. You can take the contents of these histograms. Finding evidence for the top quark is a continuing process of elimination. The trick now is to work through candidate events and try to prove that they don't represent a top signal by accounting for them in terms of known physics. That's right, and from, but from the muons also you can measure some of this right. yeah. from the calorimeter. And you're gonna it's here that a scientist's judgment and insight become critical factors. The chemistry of, of intuition plays an important role. It's sort of embellished by experience, but experience mustn't be allowed to dominate it. Otherwise, you'll never do anything brand new. John Huth is trying to narrow the search by eliminating what's called background. It takes skill and experience to distinguish a possible top event like this from an equally complicated pattern like this, a tricky decay that only mimics a top signature. What I would like to do is take my intuitive notion of what a real physics event is and my intuitive notion of what a background event is and devise some way for the computer to reject backgrounds and accept only events that I consider real physics processes. He writes a program to make cuts, to pass potential top events and fail irrelevant ones. That reduces the data still further, but it also introduces a risk. There's always a danger when you make a cut that you'll be throwing away some very interesting physics. And, and so one is always worried when one does an analysis, am I throwing out the baby with the bathwater? And, and the, the, the converse problem is if you make the cuts uh, too loose, that you'll be accepting a lot of backgrounds. In either case, you're always worried that you're going to miss something. If you're in a race with a competitor, another experiment, you're always worried that they may have a different set of cuts that'll allow them to see uh, physics that you miss. Skill and judgment are also on the line at CERN, where Andy Parker is presenting a first run-through of the cuts he's tried to make. That's a very powerful cut if you make it at this stage. You're getting a rejection of 3, 3.2 out of it. So after cutting on that, we're down to, to 29 events before this cut, and there are 10 in the peak. So you're left with 19 events, and you've sort of run out of cuts. I'm uh, trying to filter down from the, so uh, what is it, 45,000 top triggers that are on the DSTs at the moment, down to what you would expect, which are, with the present data would be of the order of one event. And I expected to find that very difficult and uh, I've actually got down to 19 events, um, which is surprising. And the reason for that seems to be that the silicon detector, well, is either working better than we expected, or it has such a serious problem that we don't know what we're doing with it at all. Let me just show you what some of these events look like. And I'll start with this guy. Is one of these events a top quark? This one looks good, with energy clusters, an electron spike, and missing energy. Confusing events are. But in fact, Andy's cuts aren't right at all. This event is literally off the wall. I wouldn't make any claim to say that I've done the job right because it's the first try, and in general, the first try is wrong. Um, there are so many ways you can get it wrong that it would be insane to try and claim that anything was right at this stage. She's a good-hearted woman. Fermilab is holding a party to celebrate its 20th anniversary.
Experimenters have scanned half a million collisions, and there's still no sign. Now they have to face up to a discouraging possibility. Maybe the top quark is heavier than they anticipated, and even the Tevatron won't be powerful enough to create it. We don't know what mass the top quark has. And if its mass is too high, we just are not going to be able to see it because the, an accelerator of this energy won't be able to produce it. So it's, it's a little bit of, we're doing well, but nature has to be kind to us and put it where we can see it. Nature has not been kind to CERN. The experimenters here were counting on a high collision rate as a key advantage in the competition. But a cold spell has gripped France and robbed CERN of precious days of running. There is a uh, contract between CERN and the uh, French electricity company that provides uh, electricity to CERN, by which if uh, they decide so, they can switch us off during working days for a maximum of 21 days. And so they turned us off for four days in a row. And uh, it's very painful to start it up again. When the accelerator is off, there are no collisions, and the edge CERN had counted on is disappearing. Still, UA2 has filled up thousands of data tapes, and its analysis work continues to push full speed ahead. But time is running out for both experiments, and the frustration of not finding top sparks a brisk trade in rumors. I received a phone call from Alvin Tollestrap, who is one of the co-spokesmen of CDF, uh, who had uh, heard rumors that we were on the point of giving a press release to announce the discovery of the top work. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was just nonsense. I, just, I don't know how he got this news, but uh, he, that, uh, he didn't even use electronic mail. He called me by phone to make sure. We hear a rumor that CERN has discovered this. We hear that they think there's a rumor that we've discovered something, and uh, as far as we know, neither one of us have discovered anything so far. It's the season of midwinter conferences, a chance to put an end to the rumors. So both experiments decide to present interim reports, but they know there's a risk in trying to say too much. The last thing that you want to do is uh, do a partial analysis, make a conclusion, announce it publicly, and then two weeks later find out that in fact that you hadn't completed it, and when you completed it, it's not there. This actually happened in 1984 when a CERN experiment got too ambitious. They claimed discovery of the top quark and then had to admit their mistake a few months later. The worst thing you can do is publish the wrong thing. It's if, uh, if CDF find the top quark and we confirm it two weeks later, I don't think that's bad for science. Um, I don't think it's really bad for us. Uh, I'd much rather be in that position than to publish a signal and then uh, three weeks later have CDF deny it. We have to figure out just what we're going to, uh, what we're going to say next week. What, I've, what I'd like to do is just quickly go through it and uh, see what changes we want to make. Uh, just four days before the conference, the CDF Top Quark Group meets at Fermilab to review Mel's report. They haven't found Top, but they can announce some limits on the Top Quark mass. Reaching agreement on limits that are safe, but not so conservative that CERN will embarrass them, is proving to be a real challenge. Become a result, a true result, if those analyses hold up. Right. Rather than just saying, however, if the current analysis holds up, you can just say the E plus nu plus jets result confirms the E plus new result at the upper end no, I, and not make I, I, I any... Really, no, I really object to that because I think what we've done is bent over backwards to show you that in fact we've taken extremely conservative stance on the efficiency. We've knocked it all to pieces and the result is still there. I don't personally think that it's really important at the present time to really make a very strong statement on that because my, my worry is that if by some chance, I mean mischance, we, we, we are wrong then we are in a bad shape. I, I think this is a very straightforward thing to say. It's not too strong. It says that it's highly unlikely. It says what we did. You're right. Yeah, I'm not so sure I believe it. Okay. So it's very straightforward. Well, what, what, and what I think it, other people share my, my opinion too, I believe. I, I think we softened it. We haven't said 90% confidence level. We just say it's unlikely. In that. Making a decision on one day and reporting it four days later is not the norm and is one of the reasons that some members of the collaboration are a little nervous. 
but even so, we have uh, at least a, a preliminary feeling that the top is not in uh, a rather broad mass range. The Fermilab team has studied collisions as high as 90 GeV, well beyond the reach of CERN. But now they have to decide where to set their limit to rule out top below a certain mass. They have to choose a number their data can support, and they don't know what figure CERN will announce. Rumors have reached Geneva that Mel will report a high limit, possibly setting it beyond the 70 GeV reach of the CERN accelerator. So at the last minute, an anxious Luigi decides to drive to La Tuile in time for the top quark session. I don't know what uh, Mel Schockert will say today, but uh, if indeed they exclude a top uh, lighter than 75 GeV, it would, very, it would probably mean that uh, we would not see it at CERN. Now the case where one of the top quarks decays semi-leptonically and the other one decays hydronically. Here it's the now the moment of truth. The CDF group has hammered out a limit. Mel has explained the state of the analysis. What number will he give for the lowest possible mass of the top quark? Conclusion then is that the CDF search for the top quark is in progress for a number of final state channels. If the current analysis holds up, then the mass of the top is not likely to be below approximately 60 GeV over C squared, again, assuming the normal charge current decay. The CDF limit is only 60 GeV, and CERN is still in the running. Uh, yeah. What is your interpretation of the mu gamma event? I have no interpretation of the, of the, of the mu gamma event. I, I don't know. Uh, I Luigi don't, is jubilant. The top quark is still fair game. Yes. Now it's Mel's turn to worry. He knows CERN hasn't found the top quark. But will UA2 reveal an even higher limit and take the lead in the race? At Fermilab, at almost exactly the same moment, Andy Parker is about to present CERN's findings. I can show you one here. Members of the CDF collaboration are packed into the lecture hall. Now they sit and wonder which of the rumors are true. Andy leads them step by step through the details of CERN's data analysis. So my conclusions on top, there is no indication of a top signal in the UA2 data in a mass range 40 to 60 GeV. 60 GeV. After nine months of running, both experiments have come to exactly the same conclusion. And we look forward to showing you some good physics results in the future. Thank you. It would have been something of an anticlimax to announce that the top is not at uh, 60 GeV if somebody else had just told the world that it was uh, not at 90. So, uh, yeah, I was relieved. It was, um, it was actually very pleasant that, I think for both of us, in fact, that there was confirmation on both sides and no serious competition. CDF are very relaxed because they know that eventually they will outrun us. The result that we have indicates that uh, they're less likely to find it. On the other hand, we haven't uh, come out definitively and said that the mass of the top is above 75 GeV, which would really put him out of business. If, if you extrapolate from 60 GeV all the way up to 150, you could say the thing is, is running out of our reach. But there's no good experimental reason to suppose it's not at 65 at the moment. Both accelerators went back to work but their spectacular collisions were not enough. After three more months of intense effort, time ran out. The CERN experiment had reached its limit without finding top. It was a little bit disappointing not to see the top because the fact that we were able to establish a limit means that if it had existed, we would have seen it. And so, well, it's... Uh, dirty trick of nature to have put the top quark so heavy. The Fermilab run is over now too. And despite a trillion powerful collisions and the year of careful observations that fill these logbooks, they also have not found the top quark.
the experiment would not be a success if the net result was our shrugging our shoulders and say, well, we don't really know. But that's not what we're saying. We looked, and if it was there, we would have found it. But nature didn't put it there, so we'll look further. It's always more fun to find a signal than to set a limit saying, well, at this level, we didn't see anything yet. So everybody is a little disappointed there wasn't some nice signal there, and we can say, yes, there's top, this is the mass, we found it. Okay. But still, you have to say, hey, nature is what it is. We're trying to find out what that answer is. Turns out the answer is the mass is not a light mass. It is a heavy mass, and that makes it a harder object to find. I'm astonished that it hasn't been found to date. The uh, experiment, in fact, has gone far beyond what we anticipated in terms of the amount of data presented. Uh, and it's still not there, at least as far as anyone can tell. So uh, I find it actually extremely interesting from a physics point of view. Uh, the basic point here being that uh, here's an elementary constituent of matter whose mass is uh, now probably you know, 60, maybe 80 times higher than the nucleus of hydrogen. And uh, that starts uh, getting a little crazy, this concept of our, of our basic building blocks of matter. The top quark is more massive and more mysterious than anyone imagined. But that kind of surprise is what fuels progress in physics. The best thing that could possibly happen, in my view, is that experiments are done more and more carefully and that they show that there is no top quark, or at least there is no top quark lighter than 250 GeV. That would tell us that there's something wrong with our theory. It's inconsistent with the standard model. It's a contradiction. We're praying for a contradiction to build a better theory. That's what really, if we're lucky, is going to happen, that some new phenomena are going to be discovered which take us beyond the standard model, which show that the standard model works in a certain limited area, and this new, these new phenomena are going to give us a clue to a deeper theory, and one of the things that will come out of the deeper theory is an explanation of why the standard model works where it does work. Beyond the top quark, the hunt for a deeper understanding of nature will depend on new experiments across the energy frontier. And Roy Schwitters has been chosen to build the next big physics machine, the superconducting super collider. Imagine underground here is the accelerator and it stretches for 53 miles around. That's further than we can actually see from the helicopter at this height. The reason we need such a large machine is to be able to uh, obtain beam energies high enough for us to do new experiments that will take us beyond our current limit of understanding. The Super Collider proposal has been controversial, largely because it will cost $6 billion to build. But the SSC will produce collisions 20 times more powerful than Fermilabs. And at that energy, physicists expect to uncover the foundations of the standard model itself. When its 53-mile ring surrounds the town of Waxahachie, Texas, the SSC will be the largest physics laboratory on Earth. But that moment is still years away. Now we're just very anxious to get on with it, to be able to put our shovels into the ground, to have our groundbreakings, and begin uh, really constructing uh, the SSC laboratory. CERN is already operating its new machine, an electron collider 17 miles around. The race for the laurels of high-energy physics goes on. But the search for the top quark here is over, and the glory days of the proton collider are past. The top was the last possible discovery, I think, of the CERN collider. The rest is now uh, measurements of things which we know reasonably well, but we'd like to know better. Um, so we really wanted to get the discovery if it was there to be had. The higher energy reach of the Fermilab Collider gives it a bright future. And CDF will get another chance to resolve the puzzle of the top quark. I think CDF is excited because we're in a great position. We're either going to find it, or it's going to be even more important that we didn't find it. <laughs> the search for top is part of a larger quest, understanding the fundamental laws of the universe. To reach that goal, physicists must climb above the rampant diversity of nature to a place where that final understanding may be revealed. We're just going to some high place so we can 
we can see clearly. And at that high place, you may be able to see the top. You may be able to see other new particles. But really the idea is, you know, you're trying to get up somewhere where you think you can see more clearly than you can where you are right now. And so I'd love to discover the top four, um, but that's not why I'm doing this. I just want to get to that place and uh, look around. Funding for NOVA is provided by Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management and technology services for defense, space and industry. And the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. For a transcript of this program, send $5 to this address or call 212-227-READ. This is PBS.